Hello, my name is Dobbin Chow. Um, I'm the program director here at the University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus for the Internal Medicine Residency Program. Hope that uh, this is the right uh, uh, link and you are dialed in for the right program. I know that you all are looking at the dozens of program links and websites uh, uh, during this busy season. So I uh, greatly appreciate the time uh, that you've devoted to doing this. Um, uh, relax, uh, uh, sit back, get, get a cup of coffee in your hand or a glass of wine, whatever uh, works for you. Uh, this is uh, going to take a um, uh, better part of an hour, hour and a half perhaps. Uh, it's a little bit detailed. I apologize for the duration. Uh, um, I'll try to go through it um, in a uh, most expedient manner that I can. I realize that it's a lot of material. Uh, we will, uh, but I want to try to be uh, complete and then uh, give you as much information about our program as possible. Um, and because I want you to be in the position to make uh, informed decisions uh, regarding uh, where you will do your training over the next three years. Hopefully, this will address some of the questions that you all uh, 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 may, be, uh, may have. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, uh, so uh, this is this is a map of Baltimore. Uh, we're uh, located right in uh, the uh, right where the uh, star is in this uh, map. Um, we're sort of at the confluence of several highways. Uh, the 95 North goes up to Philadelphia. Uh, 95 South goes to Washington D.C. Uh, Route 83 goes up uh, in the northwest uh, towards. Uh, 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 Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and for all the world, it looks like we're at the confluence of these highways. Um, now, um, uh, if you um, uh, look a little closer, uh, this is uh, Route 83, which is this highway running um, uh, diagonally, and uh, these uh, blue dots are apartment buildings where residents have lived in the past, and uh, this is where our hospital is. And so most, m many residents, they live uh, nearby within walking distance of the hospital. And this area is called the Midtown area. Uh, there's a, um, uh, the, 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 this, uh, this area to the north is uh, largely a college campus. It's the Maryland Institute College for Art. And um, over here is the, uh, there's a lot of, um, um, uh, things associated with the arts uh, located in this Baltimore Midtown region. Uh, but people can access our hospital uh, not just by uh, living close by and walking, but also there's a, uh, a, a light rail, which is a surface trolley. It runs north-south. The northmost station is located in a suburb called Hunt Valley, and the southernmost station of light rail is located right in the uh, Baltimore Washington uh, Airport. Um, Baltimore also has one subway line called the Metro, and the the westernmost stop on the Metro line is at a suburb called Owings Mills, and then the terminal station in the east is right at Johns Hopkins Hospital. So we're uh, right on the subway stop as well. This is called State Center, so people can access our uh, site from public transportation, uh, from the suburbs, uh, or folks uh, can live uh, uh, nearby. Um, this is the downtown Inner Harbor area. So we're about maybe a mile and a quarter from the downtown Inner Harbor area. Uh, there's It's a, um, a busy area, a lot of businesses there. Uh, over here on, on the left of this picture is the National Aquarium, which is a uh, uh, tourist attraction, um, but there's a lot of uh, uh, restaurants and clubs and other distractions from our resident studies in this downtown area. Uh, meanwhile, we're located uh, close to uh, the Midtown uh, Arts District, 
And this is the Walters Art Museum, which is about three or four blocks away. Um, this is the Meyerhof uh, Symphony Hall, which is just located right behind our hospital, about maybe two blocks away. A wonderful venue for uh, for music. The Baltimore Orchestra plays there. This is the inside of the Meyerhof. It's a wonderful venue for music. Um, now, each year, there's a big festival uh, in this region called Art Fest. It's the, it's the country's largest uh, art fair. Um, unfortunately, they have it in the summertime, and it's usually uh, hot and and, um, and and muggy. Uh, but uh, it's it's quite a um, quite quite a busy and festive uh, uh, um, fair. We I told one of my friends I'm coming here to work, and they said, "Oh, great! I finally have parking for Art Fest." So this is Micah Maryland Institute College for Art, and uh, we have um, uh, we we essentially abut uh, their their campus, uh, um, which uh, which is uh, which is terrific because uh, we have um, young students uh, who uh, go to that campus. They might u utilize our our center for healthcare. Uh, the faculty also uh, live in the area. That uh, this neighborhood that. The art school is located in. It's called Bolton Hill, uh, which is a uh, uh, it's a nice neighborhood in this in in the city. Uh, the Lyric Performing Arts Center is about three blocks to the north of us, and uh, there they have um, they have they have they have different uh, um, music venues and 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 also um, the opera. Um, uh, so. I try to interest the residents in this venue for their uh, evening activities. Uh, this is uh, the library, the School of Medicine Library. Uh, it's located at the School of Medicine. It's it's uh, it's a large facility, and uh, residents uh, can uh, have access to it. Uh, very comprehensive uh, in its collections. Um, uh, meanwhile, um, there's. Um, let me uh, get you up, up to date about um, uh, the um, uh, uh, some uh, some background information about our hospital, and uh, give you a sense for how we came to be and how uh, how we became integrated with the uh, University of Maryland medical system. So this uh, hospital was formerly known as Maryland General Hospital. Uh, it's been uh, here at this site uh, for over 125 years, we're the original MGH. Uh, no, uh, we were, I, but I guess we're the second MGH, um, and it's been proud to serve this this community. Uh, and it's a diverse community. There's people associated with the arts who live in this region who utilize this campus for the healthcare. Uh, there's also um, uh, patient communities to the west. Uh, which are largely underserved areas, they and they utilize this campus for the healthcare. Um, there's also uh, just the north of us. There's uh, state office buildings, and those state employees will utilize this campus for the healthcare. So it's a, a diverse uh, set of um, uh, communities, and we're proud and honored to serve those communities over the years. Uh, now, um, uh, there's and. And it so it was a it, it, the hospital did well uh, until the 1980s. This was a challenging uh, time for hospitals all over the country. Uh, this was because uh, in about 1982, 1983, um, the uh, Medicare changed this reimbursement paradigm uh, from one in which you were paid fee for service uh, to one in which you were paid on a on a, uh, you you are paid for a diagnosis, the DRG uh, reimbursement paradigm. Uh, so what the, what does that mean? That means in the past you provided a service to a patient, you build Medicare for that service, and Medicare would pay. So each the more service that you provided, the more reimbursement you would get. And so so uh, Medicare realized that that wasn't a good approach. 
So it changed to one in which they would pay for a diagnosis. Uh, if, if you were hospitalized with heart failure, for example, uh, Medicare would give you one allotment of uh, funds to pay for that hospitalization. And whether you uh, kept the patient in the hospital for 10 days and did a lot of testing, or whether you kept the patient for two days and, re and limited the amount of testing, you only got that one allotment of money. So uh, it was quite a radical change, and hospitals uh, were challenged to try to manage that. At the same time, uh, it, a, 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 a social eco economic phenomenon was occurring uh, in all the cities along the East Coast, um, and probably elsewhere in this country as well. Uh, people were leaving the inner city and moving out to the suburbs, um, uh, flight to the suburbs. And, and the growth and popularity of the suburban lifestyle. Uh, so uh, this, this happened here in Baltimore, and there was a, uh, it was a suburb in the north uh, that did not uh, have a hospital, but it was a booming suburb, tremendous growth, and the board of directors of this hospital at that time said, gee, hey, we could do really well out there. Uh, it's a growing uh, community, a great payer mix, um, hey, let's move out there. So they actually um, purchased a 10-acre plot of land. They drafted up architectural plans to move the hospital. Um, I've seen I've seen the plans. They were so detailed. You could see where the uh, light sockets were going to go in each of the rooms. And for all the world, the hospital was going to move move there. Uh, but in uh, but uh, it, the 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 mayor came and knocked on our door. Uh, the uh, local uh, uh, representatives of Congress knocked on our door and said, gee, what's going to happen to the citizens in this area if you all leave? Mm -hmm. So the board directors uh, met and they under they came to understand that, yes, indeed, we have deep roots here. We have a commitment to these communities. They decided to stay. And so the hospital did and it's it, it, it struggled along uh, and uh, in the 1990s uh, was uh, yet another uh, challenge uh, to met hospitals all over the country because in the 1990s, uh, it, it's, there was the growth of um, a reimbursement uh, system called the H HMOs, Health Maintenance Organizations. And this was under uh, President Clinton's administration. Now, President Clinton tried to pass a health care reform bill. Uh, it did not pass, uh, but he was still able to institute policies that promoted the growth of HMOs. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what happened during that time? Well, um, HMOs were able to uh, enroll uh, tens of thousands of patients. Uh, and then they would go to hospitals. They would say, if our patient gets admitted to your hospital, here's what we're going to pay. And the hospital had the option of signing or not signing those contracts. And uh, if you uh, if you did not sign their contract, then th that HMO would say, well, thank you very much. We're going to go knock on the door of the hospital down the street. And then those patients would be admitted to your competing hospital and not your hospital. So uh, hospitals felt compelled to sign these uh, ad the, these these contracts that were um, uh, that, that did not pay well, and it adversely affected their bottom line, um, uh, and so consequently, in the 1990s, many hospitals uh, closed. Uh, that that happened all over the country, uh, and so how did uh, th this is a very difficult time. Uh, many hospitals went uh, went in the red. Uh, th 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 these were very austere times for hospitals um, in, in the U.S. Uh, so how did hospitals re respond? They joined together and formed a system. Uh, up in Boston, for example, uh, Mass General merged with Brigham. Now, up until that time, the people from those two hospitals, uh, they, wouldn't, they would not even be in the same room together. Uh, the, uh, the, it, and but they they became one uh, one one health system, uh, the partner system, uh, in New York City, uh, and it's still going on now. There's multiple systems of uh, of, of hospitals. And it's hard to keep track. Uh, you need a general ledger which hospital now is joining which system. 
Uh, and so here in Baltimore, in, 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 in Philadelphia, I think at the beginning of that decade, there were something like 20 independent hospitals. At the end of the decade, there were three hospital system. There was the Penn system, the Jefferson system, and then the Temple Allegheny system. And 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 you're going to wonder, well, what's the value of 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 of, of having this large system? Well, uh, if a hospital system, uh, um, if a hospital system controlled all the hospitals, say in uh, Western Philadelphia, and the HMO knocked on the door of of Penn and said, "Hey, hey you got to sign this contract." if you want to take care of our patients. And Penn said, no, uh, we refuse. And then none of the patients who live in West Philadelphia would not be able to go to a hospital in their neighborhood. And they would have to go uh, to another hospital 10 miles away. Um, that would not work. So then these HMOs were forced to uh, negotiate with these hospital systems and create a more favorable contract that these hospital systems would sign. So the same thing happened here in Baltimore, and uh, this hospital became part of the University of Maryland medical system. All right, so let me tell you about University of Maryland. Uh, University of Maryland uh, is now, it, it, it was, began as one hospital located in downtown Baltimore. It was built about 200 uh, years ago, more than 200 years ago, uh, and it was, uh, built to, to take care of the citizens of the state of Maryland. It was a state hospital. Now, back then, uh, you know, 200 years ago, people who lived in Maryland lived around Baltimore, and uh, one hospital would, would do the trick. Uh, the uh, hospital created a medical school uh, at 200 years ago to, to graduate doctors who would work at the hospital and take care of the citizens of the state of Maryland. Well, um, over time, uh, of course, people moved away from the downtown and from the Chesapeake Bay, and they populated the state of Maryland. And uh, so the University of Maryland said, we got to, in, or, in order to meet the mandate of trying to, trying to provide medical care to all the people in the state, uh, the University of Maryland began to um, acquire hospitals all over the state. Uh, so if you go uh, on on, on uh, I-95 North up to Philadelphia, uh, along the way, you'll encounter Upper Chesapeake Hospital, which is part of the University of Maryland. Uh, if you go um, uh, to the, the to the south, up ne near Baltimore Washington Airport, there's Baltimore Washington Medical Center, um, and that's part of the University of Maryland. Uh, there's uh, St. Joseph's Medical Center, which is a large multi-specialty hospital. Uh, north of uh, Baltimore in a suburb called Towson. Um, if you go, th if you go three hours due east from Baltimore, uh, you'll fall in the ocean. But if, but um, in that area that's east is called Eastern Shore, and there's a hospital in Eastern Shore called Shore Regional Hospital, and that's part of the University of Maryland. Um, recently, uh, there's a hospital. They, they, they built a, a new hospital in Prince George's County uh, called the uh, University of Maryland Capital Regional Hospital, and that's still in the state of Maryland, although it's it's, it's pretty close to, wa to Washington, D.C. Um, so altogether now there's about uh, 13 uh, hospitals in the system, and the largest hospital is still the University of Maryland Medical Center located downtown. Uh, and uh, and the model is that the University of Maryland downtown is the sort of the mothership, the tertiary referral center, and then the other hospitals are sister hospitals. That when they need uh, patients who when they when their patients require uh, tertiary care, uh, then they'll send the patients to the downtown University Hospital for tertiary care. And 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 you'll say, oh well, that's that's nice. Uh, well. Why do they need this hospital? We're 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 um, less than a mile away, um, or just uh, 0.8 miles north of the medical center downtown. Why would they want to acquire this small community hospital uh, just up the street? Well, uh, here's the rationale. As I mentioned, the 
the University of Maryland Medical Center and the medical school have been at the same location in downtown Baltimore for over 200 years. But like all medical centers, like all medical schools, it wants to grow and expand. But they have difficulty doing so because of its downtown location. Uh, land uh, and property are expensive in a, in a downtown location. Um, but, um, but, but the University of Maryland has, uh, has been expanding. Uh, there, was a, um, uh, there was a time when uh, shock trauma was uh, simply uh, one, a, a set of beds uh, near the ICU. Uh, now, uh, shock trauma is a hospital unto itself. Uh, the, the University of Maryland had to acquire a block of land. Uh, it built uh, the shock trauma center. Uh, it has its own ORs. It has its own beds. It has its, a landing pad on the roof for the helicopter to land and uh, bring patients there uh, who need trauma care. Uh, it has an auditorium. It's a state-of-the-art trauma center. In fact, it was, uh, I think, the first trauma center in the country, and uh, its model of trauma care uh, uh, was has set an example for the rest of the country in terms of being able to provide uh, fast, um, accessible trauma care to all the citizens of the state of Maryland and, uh, and, and yield positive um, uh, patient outcomes um, because of the rapidity with which they could get patients from their point of trauma uh, to to the OR, uh, to the medical center, and get them the care that they need. All right. Uh, so uh, so that was expensive. Uh, the the tax player, taxpayers of uh, Maryland uh, had to pay the bill for shock trauma. Um, the School of Medicine also uh, wanted to build a big research building. They had to buy a block of land. They dug a huge hole in the ground. I watched it. I watched it being built. It, it was amazing. A huge hole in the ground. They, they built a 27-story <clears throat> research center. Uh, now it's um, they spent 110 million dollars on that a building. It, uh, it's, it's a state-of-the-art research center, and it's attracted uh, researchers from all over the country to come join University of Maryland uh, in meeting its research mission. All right. Now, the Department of Medicine. It doesn't have those kinds of money uh, at the, at the downtown medical center. So when the state acquired this hospital, uh, the the Department of Medicine began to shift its clinical services up to this site. So endocrinology moved its clinics up to this site. Uh, infectious diseases moved its clinics up to its site. Sleep center moved up here to this site. Uh, pulmonary clinics moved its its uh, clinics up to this site. So. Uh, by offloading these clinical services to this site, the downtown site can continue to grow and expand, and and uh, so that so 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 that's been um, part of uh, the growth of this center here uh, since it became part of the University of Maryland Medical System in 1999, and uh, and 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 since that time, there's been a, a, a tremendous growth uh, here at this center at the Midtown campus uh, because of the increased volume of clinical services that are now being provided here. The, the ORs, for example, at the downtown site are uh, busy, uh, crowded, hard to get OR time. So the surgeons from downtown began to do their elective surgeries at this site. They were able to access the OR. Uh, patients like coming here because they could get in and out of here pretty uh, much more easily than going downtown. Um, and in fact, to accommodate the uh, the increased volume of surgeries uh, from downtown surgeons, uh, we built an we built an eighth uh, OR uh, a few years back. Um, it cost uh, it cost over a million dollars to put in a new OR. <clears throat> I think it must be the music system. Um, but, but at any rate, uh, it's it, 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 oh, the surgeons have told me that they like coming up here. It's uh, it's uh, the the OR time, the availability of um, of uh, equipment, the staff, um, it's accessible, and the patients uh, enjoy coming up here uh, and getting the surgeries done here. So, um, it's th we've had tremendous growth here, uh, and if in 2015, the two hospitals 
formally merged into one medical center with two campuses. The board of directors merged. There's one CEO. Uh, there's one faculty that goes back and forth between the two campuses. And so essentially, this campus has become a part of the University of Maryland Medical Center uh, with um, essentially one mission uh, and uh, one CEO, one board of directors. Now, uh, we've had tremendous growth at this center, as I mentioned. We now serve about 130,000 patients annually, both inpatient and outpatient. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a new state-of-the-art operating suite. Uh, they renovated the ICU here, and it's an 18-bed ICU. is staffed by University of Maryland Pulmonary Critical Care faculty. Um, and um, they, 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 they come here, they, they staff it, they teach our residents. Um, there's 158, no, I'm sorry, I apologize. There's 58 uh, pulmonary critical care faculty at University of Maryland. And uh, what they did was to identify a handful of them uh, who would come here and be here on site, rotate through our ICU for one week at a time, uh, teach our residents, give noon conference to our residents on pulmonary critical care topics, serve on committees of the hospital, and essentially become our pulmonary critical care faculty. And, and this model has really worked out well because those faculty really get to know our residents. They get to know our hospital, our policies, uh, and uh, and they will help mentor our residents who are interested in pulmonary critical care. Um, they will help them uh, get uh, uh, rotations at the downtown campus. Uh, they might introduce them to faculty who are conducting uh, research in, in particular areas. Um, and they will help uh, mentor them in terms of maturing their interest in pulmonary critical care, if, if that is their interest. The new sleep lab, uh, a sleep lab was renovated. It's, it's now here. Um, and uh, a pulmonary rehab program was uh, created, and it's now housed here. Um, and and then in 2018, they totally renovated the psych unit here. The psych unit is a 36-bed inpatient psych unit. It's uh, it's a state-of-the-art unit. People come from all over the country to visit it because everything is organized in a way that uh, uh, patients uh, can will not be able to harm themselves. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's pretty ingenious. I when I visit the unit, um, I there's things that they do that I had not, never thought of and thought that you needed to do. But uh, it's um, uh, it, a lot of thought and effort went into creating this unit, and um, it's, it's I think it's the largest psych unit in 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 Maryland. Um, and then in 2021. Uh, a new 10-story ambulatory tower was built on our campus. Uh, this is a, and I'll say a little bit more about that, uh, but it's a, a wonderful new facility. Uh, now more faculty are coming up here. Um, if they're, <clears throat> um, they, 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 because their clinics are here. And so um, more and more what's happened is that we've transformed into one large academic medical center with two campuses between the Midtown campus and the downtown campus. The only difference is that the, we have separate residency programs simply because the downtown campus is a large residency program and uh, we have a s smaller uh, program. We've kept the two programs separate for now. Uh, so this is the ambulatory uh, uh, building that's up and running. Uh, the endocrine clinic and the nephrology clinic are on the eighth floor, GI cardiology, and uh, uh, I apologize, I can't keep them all straight. Uh, GI cardiology uh, are on the ninth floor, ophthalmology and ID are on the seventh floor. All right, anyways, all I know is for sure that uh, the resident clinic is on the 10th floor. That's the top floor. And uh, it's it's a beautiful facility. Uh, the residents enjoy it. Uh, there's a large conference room there. Uh, and you'll see it on the tour video if you can if you can access it. Uh, now, uh, what, what, why build this building? And the building is so that it can uh, help uh, 
provide chronic disease management uh, for the patients in our community. So if you have diabetes, you can come to the uh, clinic, you can see the endocrinologist, you can see your primary care doctor. Uh, if you have diabetic nephropathy, you can see the nephrologist. If you have diabetic retinopathy, you can see the ophthalmologist. And so it's one center with all these different specialty areas. And our goal is to be able to provide patients all the care that they need as an outpatient uh, here in this one facility. Uh, it's uh, It's been up and running for the past three years now. Uh, we're very proud of it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's functioned well. And there's some there's coordination between the different clinics so we can get patients um, subspecialty care in different subspecialty clinics uh, and yet have it be sort of all located under one space with primary care being um, overseeing uh, the overall care of the patient. Um, this is the picture of Dr. Mohan Santa. Dr. Mohan Santa is the CEO of University of Maryland Medical System, so all 13 hospitals. Um, he's a wonderful uh, physician. Uh, he's a charismatic leader. Uh, he's a radiation on oncologist in, in, uh, in his prior uh, uh, career. Uh, yeah, Mohan still does a little radiation oncology. Uh, of course, he's pretty busy uh, sort of running the whole system, but uh, he's proud that he's still a clinician at heart. But his what his strategic vision is that uh, the that, that that the two campuses um, are are such that um, the the university the downtown campus provides uh, tertiary care uh, for all the citizens of the state of Maryland, and, and then this medical center Midtown uh, provides uh, uh, chronic uh, disease management and hospital care. For those patients who reside in our local community, so um, th th I think those are not um, uh, separate, entirely separate uh, missions. But when you meld those two missions together, uh, we feel like the University of, Mel Med University of Maryland Medical Center, with these two campuses, uh, are poised to be able to provide the care to our community, also provide care to our state. Um, now, our residency program. Our residency program, uh, the goals and mission is to allow each resident the opportunity to create and fulfill his or her uh, professional goals. Um, we want to establish a clinical learning environment in our hospital characterized by collegiality, engagement, and a passion for scientific inquiry. Uh, you know, we're a, we're a smaller hospital, certainly smaller than the downtown hospital, and uh, we uh, feel like our our residents uh, have a significant role in terms of um, nurturing this clinical learning environment. Um, the residents, uh, an important uh, value of our programs, the residents teach and support each other, and uh, we are proud that we provide high quality evidence based uh, patient care. And delivered in a compassionate, professional manner. So uh, uh, I know that this is somewhat abstract, but these are our aspirational goals. Uh, this is the goals for our program and for our residents. Now, let me introduce you to our uh, program leadership and our faculty. So I uh, am uh, fortunate enough to serve as the program director and the chair of medicine. Uh, Dr. Marciniak, who's a a pulmonary critical care specialist. She's an associate program director, and uh, uh, this is her. And she um, is um, uh, she she does uh, weeks at a time in our ICU. Uh, Jeff Trubino is uh, also an associate program director. He's one of our preceptors in the resident ambulatory uh, practice, and f and he's uh, he's outpatient based. And so he's focused on the outpatient side. He's responsible for the ambulatory curriculum, whereas Ellen is more inpatient oriented, and particularly with a focus on the critical care. Dr. Malik is our DIO, designated institutional official. Uh, every uh, teaching hospital has a DIO. Uh, they uh, report to the ACGME, uh, and um, they oversee the, the institution 
the hospital, making sure that the hospital adheres to all requirements of the ACGME. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce you to a little bit uh, to our faculty, just to give you a sense for the faculty and how they work related to the two campuses. So uh, in cardiology, uh, here's Dr. Hawk, and uh, he's been at He's been at this hospital for, I, I guess it's about 13, 13 years now, 13 or 14 years now. He's 100% based here. Uh, he has a clinic at the ambulatory center. Uh, he, so he's, he follows patients in cardiology clinic. He also conducts uh, um, uh, consult rounds uh, here uh, at our hospital. So he's 100% here. Uh, now, um, there's uh, another uh, th th a cardiologist who uh, is with him, Dr. Daryl Rubin, and Dr. Rubin is also 100% here. Uh, so between the two of them, they cover uh, the clinic, they cover uh, out, they cover inpatient consults, and they provide uh, the teaching for our residents in the area of cardiology. Uh, Evelino Vercellis is the uh, division director of pulmonary and critical care. Uh, he's uh, does uh, weeks of service on our uh, in on our ICU uh, for our residents. Uh, however, he's not a hundred percent here. Uh, he has a research lab at the downtown campus uh, in pulmonary critical care. Uh, so uh, he's yeah, he, but he also has his clinic here in the ambulatory center. So uh, he's here about fifty percent, sixty to fifty percent of the time. Uh, he often goes back and forth. There's a shuttle that goes back and forth between the downtown campus and the midtown campus. It runs every fifth, every 15 minutes. Uh, he told me he's uh, best friends with a, a shuttle bus driver because he's on it so much. Uh, Dr. Onder is the director of nephrology. Uh, she, she, there's about four or five nephrologists. So there's, there's a big division of nephrology at University of Maryland. But there's about four or five who are uh, Dr. Onder uh, rotate uh, for weeks at a time on the consult service in the hospital, but they also uh, see patients in the clinic uh, who need um, uh, nephrology consultation. Uh, I think the residents have really enjoyed working with Dr. Onder. A tremendous amount of energy and enthusiasm. Uh, Dr. Kavita Kaura is a director of hematology oncology. Uh, now, Dr. Kaura did her residency here, did her hematology oncology fellowship at the downtown campus, and then she opened up an office uh, here uh, on our campus. Uh, she's been practicing here for almost 20 years. Uh, she um, uh, has a, a senior resident uh, rotation in her office so people can learn uh, outpatient hematology oncology. She also conducts uh, inpatient uh, consults she also directs the uh, the, uh, the the cancer uh, uh, conference. That is one. That is a lecture on a, a topic in oncology uh, every month, and she uh, uh, runs that. So, um, very active in our um, residency program. Very active in our medical staff. Uh, Ray Kim is the director of GI. Uh, he has a sort of scared look on his face. And the reason why he's got a scared look on his face is because um, he's actually, he'll be actually moving on. So he's going to, he took on a leadership position at the downtown campus, and there's a new person uh, who's going to come here, be, be the director of GI, uh, I think uh, starting in January. She's coming from Johns Hopkins, uh, and um, she's uh, looking forward to working with our residents and uh taking over the, the directorship of the GI division, the GI curriculum, and the and helping the residents with maturing their interest in gastroenterology if that's what their desire is. Uh, Pat Ritzkavich is a director of ID. ID has a big presence at University of Maryland. Um, it's one of their um, pillars of, of uh, excellence. Um, big ID division. Institute for uh, Human Virology, IHV, is a large research institute located at, down, at the downtown site. Uh, the Division of, of Infectious Diseases has a 
research portfolio of over a quarter uh, billion dollars, uh, uh, and uh, great the, the great clinicians, uh, wonderful to work with. Uh, anyways, Pat and his colleagues uh, staff the ID uh, clinic. They also um, will uh, s- uh, perform consultations in the hospital. Uh, great group of uh, faculty to get to know. Uh, continuing on, Dr. Uh, Munier is the director of endocrinology. Um, he's a wonderful mentor and, and, and educator and clinician. Uh, Dr. McDashie is the director of rheumatology. Uh, both of these uh, folks are also the director of endocrinology and rheumatology, respectively, at the downtown campus. Um, and so they uh, have they wear uh, two hats. Uh, the one is the director of uh, of their division here and also director of their division at the downtown campus. Um, the geriatrics is based at the VA, and uh, Jake Blumenthal is director of the geriatrics curriculum. All third-year residents rotate uh, at the uh, Baltimore VA uh, in geriatrics uh, with Jake and his uh, group. Uh, it's well thought of rotation, and they uh, f- there's a lot of focus on learning geriatrics during that month. Uh, the emergency medicine curriculum is uh, run by Dr. Afra Ali. Uh, she's a faculty in emergency medicine. Um, she's uh, all interns rotate uh, through the emergency uh, department for one month at a time. Uh, and uh, so Dr. Ali uh, runs that rotation. Uh, she uh, makes sure that uh, you get a breadth of uh, clinical exposure um, and there's a set of lectures that you go to, emergency medicine, every Wednesday morning. Uh, it's a well thought of rotation. And she's a very, um, very energetic and very passionate educator. Her specialty is, uh, is simulation, and she enjoys uh, teaching using simulation. Uh, palliative care is uh, Dr. Alexander, uh, but uh, she's retiring, and the uh, palliative, palliative care. Uh, services from downtown are coming up here and assuming uh, palliative care consultation services here at the uh, Midtown campus. And uh, we're going to hear more about um, who is going to uh, d- uh, do that. Uh, but um, so that that will be a change that's coming. Uh, but we're celebrating Dr. Alexander's retirement. Uh, she's been at the University of Maryland for almost uh, 30 years uh, in different roles. Okay, so um, talk about the, uh, the the call schedule. By the way, I don't know who these crazy people are. Uh, they snuck their way into the presentation. Okay, so the call schedule, there's three war teams. On two of the teams, there's one resident, two interns. On one of the teams, there's one resident, one intern. And there's two medical students on each team. Now, um, the the team with one intern and one resident, that's the intermediate care unit. That's a, uh, uh, it's a smaller uh, team because there's a smaller number of patients. Uh, let me show you. Uh, and there's a night flow team, I'm sorry, uh, that works from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, they consist of one resident, one intern, and one medical student. And uh, in general, uh, the team sign out to the long call team at about four o'clock, and the long call team is here until seven o'clock, uh, and then at seven o'clock p.m. they sign out to the night float team, and the teams rotate being on long call uh, every three days. So here's a mock-up of the way that the teams look, and uh, the purple and gold teams are uh, resident. Um, uh, these are resident uh, uh, ward teams. Uh, they they cap at uh, 16 patients, so the maximum that an intern might have on their service is uh, eight patients. Um, the, the sometimes they're at 16, but I see them sometimes at 12. I see them at 14, uh, but never more than 16. Uh, the orange team uh, caps at seven. The reason why the orange team is less is because they're the intermediate care unit. These are patients who are too sick for the regular floors, but they're not quite sick enough for the ICU, and so they call this intermediate care. Um, they're 
the, the, there's a lot of patients with uh, COPD exacerbation, for example, and they're on um, high flow oxygen or they're on BiPAP uh, and they need close monitoring. Uh, people with uh, mild DKA, uh, people with uh, heart failure, um, uh, and that's uh, somewhat tenuous. So these are people who uh, a little bit need a little bit more closer monitoring um, than the regular ward teams. Now, between the purple and gold teams, they accept patients in a serial fashion, the cap of 16 and cap of 17 on the orange team. Um, the night float emits a maximum of five patients overnight, and then in the, at seven in the morning, they transfer these patients over to the day teams. Um, now, the, the teams take turn being on long call throughout the month. They take long call every three days. Um, the teams will have either Saturday or Sunday off. And to, to make that happen, a transitional year intern uh, each month will work. They, they have a rotation where they work on the, ro work on the wards uh, Friday through Sunday, and they help uh, manage uh, a ward service. And then they have Monday and Tuesday off. So that's a rotation for them. And by having them there over the weekend, it's able to, we're able to give the interns, um, uh, make sure everyone gets one day off a week. Now, the yearly schedule has changed this year to a schedule of 13 blocks. Each block is exactly four weeks long. Uh, before, we used to have 12 blocks, each block one month long. But as you know, the months vary in duration. So this is more um, uh, uh, more predictable in the way, in the sense that every block starts on the same day of the week, it ends on the same day of the week, and it's exactly f uh, f uh, four weeks long. And so the total number of calls, uh, total number of weekends, uh, it's the same uh, year, uh, block by block by block. Here's the daily schedule if you're on the wards. So it's the day starts at 7 in the morning. You get signed out from night float. Uh, then you uh, conduct pre-rounds. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that is. I see some residents walking around drinking coffee. Uh, but they, uh, I guess they get familiar with their patients. And, so, and then at 9 o'clock, there's attending rounds uh, with a hospitalist. Uh, and then uh, at about 1045, there's interdisciplinary rounds in which uh, they uh, they round on their patients with uh, social work and case management uh, and that noon conference every day and then at uh, four o'clock their sign out rounds to the long call team now on tuesday mornings at seven there's a case conference uh, we encourage residents to attend uh, they depends if they're if they're busy uh, then the uh, they're, they're certainly excused. Uh, we, we try to encourage them to attend. It's a, it's a nice conference. All medical students attend it, and they, they, a case is presented by a, one of the interns. Okay. Now, here's the first year schedule. I'd like to go through it a, a little bit, um, and then I'll summarize it at the end. Uh, so uh, there's 13 blocks. Each block is four weeks long. So there's four blocks of wards, one block of night float, two blocks of ICU. The ICU CCU is a combined unit here. One block of endocrinology, one block of emergency medicine. One is the ambulatory block, and then uh, two electives and one vacation. So one, so there's four weeks of vacation. Um, the the ambulatory block, you uh, rotate through, uh, surgic, through so surgical subspecialty offices. So uh, ENT, urology, orthopedics, uh, so you rotate, rotate through various subspecialty offices. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say more about the other rotations later. Now, uh, we have a transitional year uh, program here, and uh, I, I want to mention that only to, I, I want to mention them only to say that their schedule is very much similar to the categorical internal medicine schedule. They have a they have slightly fewer general medicine wards, uh, but they have this uh, cross cover um, 
month uh, w in which they work um, uh, on the wards uh, on um, fr fr Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday to um, help out uh, the general medicine uh, interns uh, so everyone gets a, gets a one day off a week. Uh, on They get mo Monday and Tuesday off. On Wednesday and Thursday, they do ambulatory. So they get they meet their ambulatory requirement by rotating in clinics during, on that cross cover block. Um, general surgery uh, is um, something that the uh, transitional years are required to have. They have an ambulatory block, but I, I only show, share this with you uh, to um, uh, to, say, to give you insight that our interest is to have the transitional year schedule, have the transitional year requirements, have the transitional year responsibilities be the similar and mirror those of the uh, categorical uh, internal medicine intern schedule. Uh, our, because uh, our view is that uh, we have one internship group. Uh, they are all uh, in the same boat. They're all pulling together. Uh, our interest is that so we have one confluent group, and um, it, and and I think that will make the internship go smoother, uh, and develop a greater sense of community and collegiality. Because as you know, if everyone in the boat uh, pulls with the same vigor, pulls with the same amount of uh, uh, of uh, strength, uh, then the uh, boat will go in the in the right direction. You like that? Okay, I'll do it again. Watch. Whoop. All right. Well, all right. Yeah, there you go. See, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> I worked for a while to make that happen. Uh, all right. Anyway, um, uh, and I think it, it, I think it happens. Uh, the transitional year uh, interns, uh, they uh, they have the same uh, requirements in terms of uh, what they do when they're on the wards. And so if you ask the nurses, you ask the faculty, uh, is this a transitional year intern or is this a categorical uh, intern? Uh, there's no one will know the difference unless you happen to talk to the transitional year intern and they tell you they're a transitional year intern. They're held to, everyone's held to the same standards. Um, and we have 10 uh, transitional year interns. We have nine categorical interns. And so we want them to be to, to gel together uh, to form one group, and I think for the most part, uh, it, it happens. Uh, we it, we're, we're, we try to work towards that end. Um, I I uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, a few years ago to attend a wedding of one of our categorical residents. After he graduated residency, he, he got married, and uh, at the wedding, uh, there were just as many transitional year interns with whom he did internship with as categorical uh, residents with which he did residency with. Because during internship, you form close bonds with, with your co-interns and you form close bonds with the transitional year re interns as well as with the, your own categorical uh, colleagues. Second year. All right, so this is the picture of the ICU and this is them at night and I thought they worked hard at night taking care of the ICU patients. But look, this is what they're doing. They're sitting there eating pizza all night. Okay. Uh, anyway, this is the schedule uh, for the second years. Uh, three and a half blocks on uh, on the wards. Uh, one block is a quality improvement block. Uh, that is a uh, month in which you uh, work on a QI project. Uh, you work with the uh, our QI our quality improvement uh, department. Uh, you get mentored on developing a project, and you work on that project uh, for the next year. And uh, the expectation is that you complete the project by the time you graduate. And at the week of graduation, we have all the senior residents present their projects. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's really exciting to see uh, the projects that the residents have done uh, and how they've contributed to improving care uh, at our hospital. Some of these projects uh, have been able to be uh, published in the literature um, and uh, 
and uh, disseminated uh, to other hospitals. Uh, and it's, uh, it's so it's really great to see. Um, there's two ICU blocks, uh, one month, one block of night float, one block of neurology. So that neurology block is located at the downtown campus. At the downtown campus, they have a neurology residency, neurology faculty, neurology grand rounds. Uh, and so it's a robust rotation. Uh, you, um, the residents have enjoyed that rotation. They get, uh, they get referred patients from all over the state with neurological uh, diseases, um, some interesting conditions, and uh, our residents have enjoyed that rotation. Uh, so um, ambulatory block here uh, is uh, is primary care. So uh, whereas the ambulatory block in the first year was subspecialty, surgical subspecialty offices, uh, this, these, the block in the second year is primary care. You have two electives and uh, one block of vacation. During the second year, uh, I think the transition from first year to second year is a much more challenging transition than from medical student to intern. As an intern, you always have oversight, you, know, you always have backup, and it'll be the, uh, the, the resident. Uh, as a second year resident, the expectation is that you are uh, in charge of the service, uh, you're given a responsibility for managing the patients on the service, uh, you you uh, have uh, autonomy and uh, accountability to the degree that you feel comfortable. There's always backup, um, but uh, we want the residents to feel like th that they have the decision-making authority uh, to manage their cases. I want them to feel like they can develop and mature their own clinical style and approach. So there's... Uh, increased responsibility for them. They're also uh, expected to teach and mentor the interns and the students on the service. Uh, and that uh, is a, a important role. Uh, our, my, my, my hope, my aspiration is that when all of our residents graduate, that when they graduate, they will look for opportunities to be involved in teaching. And that teaching was one of their uh, core skills and uh, whether they teach medical students, they teach residents, they teach other doctors, uh, that teaching is part of their uh, core values and skills when they graduate. So the second years should be making the transition from uh, following orders to uh, giving orders. Here's a third year uh, schedule. There's uh, one month on the wards, two months of ICU, half block of night float, a uh, half block of nephrology, and this is a nephrology uh, clinic. Um, uh, I think uh, what we came to learn is that uh, if you uh, adjust to the inpatient service, uh, that you see a lot of patients with end-stage renal disease, and they're on dialysis, and you think that nephrology is managing patients on dialysis. Uh, but uh, nephrology is really a a challenging subspecialty, and the purpose is to, to, to manage and treat patients with chronic kidney disease to prevent, prevent them from going to dialysis. And uh, the residents who do the nephrology uh, clinic, uh, they have found that uh, the clinic experience is, is more diverse in terms of uh, exposure to pathology than the inpatient service. And uh, there's a different set of of uh, skills and uh, and medical knowledge material uh, that they learn during that rotation. It's a two-week block. Uh, there's uh, one month of geriatrics, as I mentioned, it's at base at the VA. Uh, there's uh, one ambulatory block uh, here, and you're, you're going to say, well, what is that one? And that block is up to you. Now, you can pick a subspecialty area that you're interested in, and you can do ambulatory block in that area. If you're interested in GI, you can do GI clinic. If you're interested in cardiology, you can do cardiology clinic. Um, you, so it's a uh, it's, there's, there's um, uh, options there. Uh, and yes, um, now you notice that rheumatology is a required rotation in the third year, and endocrinology is a required rotation in the first year. 
Uh, why do we have that? Um, I feel like those two specialties, um, to really get your hands around those two specialties, to learn the medical content and endocrinology and rheumatology, you pretty much have to go to the clinic because that's where the patient care is mostly housed. Uh, there's not a lot of rheumatology or endocrinology in the hospital. It's mostly outpatient because uh, the, the diseases are most, mostly outpatient oriented. Uh, so we felt like to really know those two subspecialty areas, you got to do those rotations. So we've mandated those rotations. Um, they basically function like required electives. I know that's an oxymoron, but we require uh, endocrinology and rheumatology for uh, residents. We feel like they have to know that material, and the best way to know that material is go where those patients are, and that's in the clinic. Now, uh, sort of following that f same philosophy, we've required a HEMOC uh, uh, outpatient rotation during the third year. Uh, this rotation is... Um, uh, interesting because uh, you see a, a in the hospital when you see a patient with cancer, uh, it, it's these are patients who are more advanced in their cancer. Uh, they're suffering because of it. But nowadays, a lot of people with cancer are surviving their cancer. They're doing well. Uh, they're uh, they're working, um, and um, and and so when the residents did this rotation, uh, they got to learn about. Um, uh, cancers that are um, largely treated as outpatients. Uh, they get uh, there's an infusion center at that site, um, and and they get a broader um, uh, spectrum of ty different types of cancers, uh, including um, uh, bone marrow type cancers, and also they see a good deal of hematology, a little bit more hematology than what they see in the in the in the hospital. So it's been a good rotation, and residents uh, have enjoyed it. Um, now, uh, there, in addition to three electives that residents can uh, can choose, there's a one cardiology uh, rotation. That's based at the downtown site. Why is that? Because here at this site, uh, we don't have uh, a, a, a angioplasty. We don't have um, bypass surgery. Um, so. Uh, so, for example, if you come to our hospital and you have acute coronary syndrome, uh, we call it we call it Uber for you. No, we don't call it Uber for you. We we, we send you to the downtown campus, and there, there you'll get your uh, angioplasty, your stent, you get your crud, you get your coronary artery massaged, whatever it is they do, and uh, and so that patient population, those procedures. Are available at the downtown campus and not at this campus, so we have mandated a rotation at the downtown campus in cardiology, so they residents get exposure uh, to uh, invasive cardiology to uh, acute coronary syndrome. Uh, now, uh, there's a second message here, uh, and what is that? You know, if you're interested in uh, interventional cardiology, uh, this probably is not going to be the best site for you. Now, you're not going to see these patients on a regular basis until you do that rotation. Uh, the downtown site would be a better location for you. Okay, so uh, I've, I've summarized the uh, the general medicine wards, uh, ICU, uh, ambulatory blocks, the night floats, uh, and the elective uh, uh, rotations here. Um, I mentioned about the different types of inventory blocks over the three years. I mentioned that endocrine and rheumatology are required electives, if you will. Um, the QI bl um, block is a, um, it's, it's mostly a library-based rotation. You're working on your uh, QI project. Uh, neurology and cardiology are, lo are located at the downtown site, um, and, and geriatrics are lo located at the VA. So residents have to do uh, at least two rotations at the downtown site. Many of them do more. They can pick and choose other elective rotations that do downtown, um, uh, depending on your interests and preferences. Uh, this is the downtown Inner Harbor area. You can 
park your boat in the inner harbor and uh, visit the, the sites. Okay, the uh, the clinic. So the clinic is uh, a continuity clinic for all the residents for all three years. Uh, it's uh, We have Epic in the clinic and Epic on the wards. Uh, you, we have this arrangement as sort of a hybrid uh, X plus Y kind of schedule. There's no clinic when you're on the wards, ICU, knife float. But when you're not on the wards, ICU, or knife float, or vacation, then you have two sessions per week. So basically, non-call rotations, you have two sessions per week in the clinic. Uh, so the total number of clinic sessions over the three years is um, is, is is meets the ACG, ACGME requirements. You're supervised by full-time general trauma medicine faculty. Um, I mentioned Dr. Gerbino. Uh, he's the associate program director. He's a, one of the faculty supervising residents in the clinic. Uh, they utilize the Yale ambulatory curriculum, which is a case-based curriculum, and a different case is presented every week from the Yale ambulatory curriculum. And this uh, this is a session that's held at the beginning of clinic uh, from a 1 to 1.30, and by going through all the cases in the Yale curriculum, you have covered um, a, covered general told medicine very well, uh, and uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a good um, review. Uh, in terms of our medical conferences, uh, there's um, uh, all the subspecial subspecialty areas are covered in our conferences. Uh, how do we do that? So we, we take uh, Harrison's textbook of medicine. Oh, we uh, tease out all the topics in Harrison's, and then we make sure that each of these topics are covered. And it turns out that we can cover all the topics in Harrison's about one and a half years. So basically, we repeat the curriculum uh, um, uh, twice over three years. Now you're not gonna, you're not going to go to every conference because you'll be on night flow, you'll be on vacation, you might be doing a rotation at the downtown site. So, um, but we hope that. By giving the curriculum that lasts one and a half years and then repeating it, uh, that over the course of three years, you'll have a chance to you know, hear uh, most of our subspecialty lectures. Um, there's a case conference, as I mentioned, every Tuesday morning at 7 in the morning. Once a month, there's an ambulatory presentation on an ambulatory topic. This is given by the residents who are on ambulatory block. m and &M is twice a month. Journal club, uh, the journal club is once a month, and grand rounds is twice a month. Uh, journal club is uh, is uh, interesting. We have a journal club. Um, it's a it's a uh, it's it's a it's a written um, a document. It's a manuscript. Uh, residents have to submit a review of a journal to the journal club. Um, Journal, I guess uh, it's uh, and it's published every quarter, um, and and the reason why we do that is because we want residents to be reading the journals, and you submit a basic review of the journal, uh, and then uh, every quarter that's published. Uh, now, um, in addition to that, once a month we have a lecture in which a, a second or third year resident presents a a, a, a article we discuss in detail. Um, and that's a rich uh, discussion. Um, this is the simulation lab at the downtown campus. Uh, we have access to it. We have a simulation curriculum. Um, we also have a smaller simulation lab here at this campus, and um, we do use that as well. Uh, we have mock codes. The downtown campus is quite is a little bit more robust in terms of the equipment that they have available. Uh, so we have point of care ultrasound. This is the machine that's in the uh, ICU. Uh, this is the, this is the machine, not this person standing next to it, who thinks he's a machine. Uh, we also have a uh, nice uh, ultrasound machine in the uh, emergency medicine department. The emergency medicine faculty are all quite facile with uh, point of care ultrasound, and they enjoy teaching our residents uh, how to use it. And then we purchased two smaller devices for the wards. So the residents on the wards have access to it um, and they can learn how to, how, how to, uh, how to use it. 
Um, we did have a point of care ultrasound curriculum. Um, it's um, uh, the, the challenge has been uh, to train uh, train train our faculty uh, to be uh, skilled in doing it, and then for them to teach our residents. Uh, but um, at nighttime, uh, we have a emergency medicine physician in house uh, who's on call for emergencies such as uh, rapid responses and codes and intubations. And that emergency medicine doctor will often uh, teach residents on the knife float rotation about using point of care ultrasound. There's a fair amount of downtime during the night and that's an opportunity to learn uh, ultrasound uh, at, uh, on the patients who are admitted that day. Uh, what So what we're not, uh, we're not a fellow dominated program. Uh, we do have fellows here. There's a pulmonary critical care fellow uh, who uh, is housed in the ICU, and they help uh, residents with uh, procedures. Uh, they help uh, residents with um, uh, uh, intubation and, and managing the patients uh, uh, in the ICU. Uh, they're very helpful, and our residents enjoy working with them. And each year, they honor one of the fellows by giving an award uh, to the best fellow. Um, there's uh, also a ID fellow who helps out with the ID service. But in general, uh, it's when you call for cardiology, it's a cardiologist who comes see your patient. It's a cardiologist that you'll 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 talk to, you get to know. Uh, when you call for nephrology consult, it's a nephrologist who comes see your patient. The nephrologist will talk to you. You get to know them. And and uh, so it's not a it's not a fellow dominated program. That they won't be uh, stealing procedures from you. Uh, the, the the fellows, in fact, are are there to help train residents on doing procedures. If that's your interest, uh, there's no requirement to do procedures. But if you're interested, they will um, they will they'll be uh, they'll be there uh, in the ICU to help you with that. Uh, we're not a medical school here at this site. Uh, the University of Maryland School of Medicine is located at the downtown site. Um, we uh, they do rotate here, here. The purple team. Uh, we have two University of Maryland School of Medicine uh, students who are doing their clerkship uh, here. Um, because we are not able to populate all of our ward services uh, with medical students, we have a arrangement with American University of Antigua uh, to uh, put students on all of our uh, services. I think that's that's important. I think uh, it's critical that the residents have a student on the service. It changes the, the, the climate of the, 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 the team, uh, it changes the focus. Uh, it, it puts the resident in the position of training and uh, mentoring, educating the students. Um, it, it makes a big difference when there's a student on the road, on the service and when there's not. Uh, so, um, uh, the ICU team has uh, students. Um, some of the elective services have students. And uh, I think this is important, uh, not just for the student, but for our residents. We don't have on-site research labs here. There's no intent to bring research labs up here to this site, especially since they built a large research building uh, at the downtown site. However, our residents uh, who, who are interested in conducting research, uh, they do have the opportunity to uh, to to seek out those opportunities uh, to speak with uh, with the faculty who do uh, do bench research uh, as well as clinical research and gain uh, mentorship and support uh, for um, research. We don't do bypass surgery here. We don't do transplants here. If those are your interests, then this may not be the right uh, fit uh, for you. Now. We don't have sub subspecialists in every field. Uh, what do we mean that, by that? <clears throat> so, we, so we we have cardiologists here, but we don't have left atrium specialists. Uh, we um, if, if if we we have patients with heart failure, they're managed by uh, our cardiologists, but we don't have sub sub specialists who all they do is uh, is advanced heart failure. Uh, if patients need uh, have a refractory advanced heart failure, then they get sent to downtown. And there, 
they'll have subspecialists who will uh, get them uh, ready for uh, LVAT, get them ready for transplant. Um, those uh, types of services are not available here. Uh, similarly, uh, we have gastroenterologists here, uh, but uh, we don't have uh, pancreatologists. Uh, now, um, we, uh, if, the, if we have a patient with advanced cirrhosis, uh, we send them to downtown. Uh, they have a uh, liver center there. Uh, they have hepatologists uh, stationed there, and they have a, one of the largest transplant liver transplant programs in the country. Uh, and um, but uh, those transplant services and those physicians associated with transplant are not going to be based uh, here. Um, it, it, residents can access those specialists and access those uh, that 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 patient um, exposure by rotating on those services at, at the downtown site, but not not at this site. Um, so what's unique? Uh, I think uh, our our program has been here for over sixty years. It's highly valued by the institution. Um, it, the the, uh, the 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 hospital is very proud of the residency program. Um, they I I I meet with the the the, the CEO of the hospital um, regularly. They always ask about how the residency is doing. What can they do to help? Uh, and so that degree of support. Uh, is not always uh, universal around the country. Secondly, uh, our philosophy is that I want this to be a resident-run program. Um, it's much more fun. I feel like I'm sitting in the back of the bus. I want the residents to be driving the bus, uh, finding initiatives for us to pursue, uh, and uh, and moving us forward. Um, it's, now, uh, so for example, uh, I'm not an expert in point-of-care ultrasound. I wouldn't even know how to turn turn one of those machines on, uh, but the residents had an interest in it. They developed a curriculum. They identified faculty. Uh, they came to me when they they needed funding because we needed to buy a couple of ultrasound devices. Uh, we were able to look under some mattresses and found some money. And those things are those things are, uh, are not cheap. Uh, in fact, one one little ultrasound machine costs more than my car. Um, of course, I don't I don't drive a fancy car, but uh, at any rate, that was, we 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 able to um, we got two ultrasound devices for the wards, and residents are uh, can, can can use them. Similarly, uh, a we one of the residents was interested in simulation, created a simulation curriculum, and. Uh, we were able to utilize the simulation lab at the downtown campus. Uh, in fact, the sim director of simulation at downtown campus told me that our residents use it uh, to a greater the degree than the downtown residents use it. Um, uh, and, and, uh, we think it's a great resource. Um, now, um, uh, uh, other examples is, uh, is, is wellness. Uh, we had some residents interested in wellness. Uh, they uh, created a wellness uh, uh, initiative. Um, again, I'm not an expert in wellness. I wish I was, um, but um, they identified a faculty member who has that interest, and uh, we have a, um, a wellness committee. Uh, so the message here is that uh, you as a resident can make a difference, and as you as a resident should make a difference. And at the end of your residency, we want every res every resident to look back and ask themselves, "Hey, did I make a difference to this hospital? Did I make a difference to the program?" And I hope that you will. Uh, and I hope that that's the approach you're going to take as you go on in your career. That as you go on to whatever organization you join, uh, whatever uh, institution you join, that you uh, hold yourself accountable to making a difference to those patients, to that institution, to the quality of care, um, that that's a standard that you hold yourself to and that, that should begin during your residency training. Uh, lastly, uh, there's a, always a balance between providing education and service. Um, 
you know, we feel that our residents are here for an educational experience. They're not here to provide service. Uh, they're not here as service workers uh, for our for, for our patients. Um, uh, you know, if you go right now and you take our residents out of the hospital, our hospital wouldn't close. Uh, we have uh, we have intensivists. Uh, we have hospitalists. Uh, the hospital was still run. Um, so uh, let me give you an example of this. Uh, the, the according to the ACGME, the service cap on the resident service on the wards uh, is uh, is is ten. Interns uh, cannot have more than ten, according to the ACGME. Uh, well, uh, so we were we we were never at ten. Uh, we were uh, per rep, per intern. Uh, the, the, we, we, we would be um, the, 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 so an intern a service is equal to two interns so so the cap was 20 per service but we were never at 20 we would be uh, 13 14 15 12 uh, never really got to 20 except suddenly we were at 20 every day during the pandemic, oh my goodness! The, the, during during COVID, uh, we were busy. All hospitals around the country were busy, and we were at twenty uh, for uh, for months. Uh, and and I thought, okay, after this pandemic, uh, things will settle back down to 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 what it was to uh, to our norm. <clears throat> well, it didn't. What what happened during the pandemic was that. Uh, Baltimore uh, University of Maryland became a referral site, and the downtown campus, which has a lot of ICU beds, they were the COVID hospital. Non-COVID patients were being sent to our hospital, and so we were we were very busy with, but mostly with non-COVID patients. Uh, and then what happened was people found out all over the state that hey. If you needed a hospital bed, send them to Midtown, and we so we were getting patients from all over the state. Um, uh, it's it's been a um, uh, it's been a learning experience, and because uh, we it's it's interesting to get patients from all over the state. It, it's it's a wider diversity, uh, in a wider set of uh, pathology, but at any rate. Hot service the resident services were busy, so I said, "Let's reduce the service size from twenty patients down to eighteen patients." So we did that. And the residents uh, the residents were happy, and the um, uh, but then they came back to me uh, about four months later, and they said, "Well, eighteen is good. But we're still busy, and we feel like we don't have the time and effort to." Uh, to learn uh, from each patient, that our focus is on making sure that patients get the service that they need, uh, get the clinical care that they need, and but uh, um, the educational mission was not being met to its fullest. So I said, okay, let's cut down to 16. So we reduced the service uh, cap to 16, and now uh, it it was it was better. Uh, the residents are still busy. Uh, they have seen a good breadth of pathology, uh, and uh, they can have they have the time and 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 uh, availability to uh, extract the educational experience from every patient that they see. Because that's my goal, is that they that this is a learning experience, and each patient should be a learning experience. Okay, you'll say, well, that's nice. Uh, the, each each service now is only sixteen patients. <clears throat> where do those other where do those patients go? So each service uh, is now down by four, uh, from twenty to sixteen. We can't just let those patients go uh, sit there in the hospital without someone taking care of them, right? So we the hospital had to had to engage. A new hospitalist service uh, had to create a new hospitalist service to take care of these patients who are not on the teaching service to to create an additional not teaching service. Now, 
hospice, uh, if you know this, hospitals don't grow on trees. And to create an additional hospital, not teaching hospital service, you basically need to have two hospitalists, one who works for seven days straight, and then they're off for seven days, and then there's a second hospitalist who works for seven days straight. And so they rotate like this, seven days on, seven days off. So that requires uh, hiring two full-time hospitalists. And uh, so that, if you add up the bill for that, that's uh, uh, half a million dollars. Um, now, um, but so I went to the hospital. I said, we're cutting down from 20 patients all the way down to 16 patients. Uh, that required the hospital investing a, you know, half a million dollars. Uh, but the hospital made that commitment because they realized that we don't want to compromise the educational experience of our residents on the inpatient service. Uh, okay, so um, uh, these are, okay, so this little fella in the corner here, uh, he's not one of our residents, okay? But uh, I'm often asked, what are we looking for in a candidate? And uh, so uh, we, our philosophy is that um, residents are, um, they're adults, they're adult learners, and adults are responsible for their educational experience. Uh, so we're looking for fo folks who have demonstrated that they have an initiative, they have intellectual curiosity, they have self-discipline, they have a motivation, and uh, and have the ability to motivate themselves. They're resourceful. Uh, they have drive. They work as a member of the team. Now I know this is sort of abstract, uh, but let me give you give you give you uh, give you some examples. Um, all right, so uh, we had a uh, we had a, a resident who was um, rota uh, rotating as an intern in the ICU, and uh, he uh, rotated in the ICU and he worked with the pulmonary critical care faculty, and so he said um, he said to me, "Hey, I really enjoy pulmonary critical care. Uh, I think uh, I want to pursue this further. Uh, seems like a great specialty." Uh, so I said, uh, I said, okay, great. Uh, well, uh, talk to the faculty, and maybe you can uh, do a pulmonary critical care elective at the downtown site. Uh, so he did, and he uh, did a interventional pulmonary consult elective, uh, and uh, the, it rotated with the interventional pulmonologist at the downtown. Uh, saw some interesting pathology, uh, and in working with the Pulmonologists there, they uh, they identified some patients uh, that they thought would uh, was would do, would be interesting to write up, uh, and so he wrote manuscripts to, and submitted them. Uh, he submitted them as posters for the chest meeting, and uh, both uh, post both them both uh, abstracts got accepted for poster presentation, and. Uh, and uh, so he went to chest, he presented his cases, and he won a third prize as third place as the best uh, poster presentation at the meeting. There were hundreds of posters at that meeting. Um, and uh, he came back and he re was, uh, was uh, re invigorated uh, regarding his interest in palm grit. And, and so that's a, that, that, that was one resident's journey. Uh, but and, and all the all the residents have us can, can give you a similar uh, story. Uh, s some have decided to pursue um, uh, infectious diseases. Some have decided to pursue uh, cardiology, uh, uh, nephrology. Uh, some have decided to pursue primary care. Uh, endocrinology is a popular uh, uh, destination. So uh, they all have uh, developed different interests, but we want them to develop an interest on their own, use the resources that we provide to them. But it's not our job to push them, uh, to uh, steer them down any particular path, uh, that, th that they take the um, initiative and, and, and utilize their own uh, motivation uh, and passion uh, to find their path. So at the end of the three years, all, each one will have a different path a path that they negotiated themselves, a path that they can be proud of, uh, and 
uh, and, and leave their own uh, legacy behind. Uh, okay, the, uh, when you graduate, uh, you will have different um, uh, options available to you. Uh, what have residents uh, who've graduated in the past pursued? Uh, some have gone to private practice, either uh, work as a hospitalist in a hospital, work in general total medicine. Uh, some have gone on to fellowships. Some have gone to academic medicine. Let's uh, go through some of the prior classes. Uh, so in 2019, uh, we had uh, one person go to ID, one person go to nephrology, one person go to critical care, um, one person in, the, in, in cardiology, one uh, uh, sleep medicine, uh, which is based actually here at Midtown. The sleep medicine fellowship is based here at Midtown. Uh, one to GI, uh, one in general internal medicine um, and, and, and primary care out in California. In 2020, uh, four people went to cardiology. Do we need that many cardiologists in this country? I don't think so. Uh, one person went to Palm Crit, uh, one went to endocrine, uh, two went to GI, and one uh, is uh, still a hospitalist in, uh, in, in, in Lawrence, Massachusetts. In 2021, uh, one went to cardiology, one went to ID, uh, one went to endocrine, uh, one did the sleep medicine fellowship, uh, one did GI, uh, three went to primary care, and then one went to hospitalist medicine. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm being a primary care physician myself and glad to see folks going into primary care. That's um, a, um, I think that's a very worthy career destination and uh, something that uh, you can find career satisfaction in, uh, in, in, in pursuing and uh, never have a dull day in your life. In 2022, uh, one person went to nef uh, nephrology, one to cardiology, uh, one to endocrinology, one to palm crit, uh, one to GI, and then four to hospitalist medicine um, in uh, various sites uh, around the country. Uh, one of them uh, is a uh, is a academic hospitalist uh, here. Uh, and uh, we're fortunate to have him. In 2023, two people went to vascular medicine. Uh, that's a new growing specialty. Um, if, um, it's an interesting uh, 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 area that's growing. Um, yeah, and uh, both of them are doing well. Um, the, the one person went to endocrine, one person went to rheumatology, one in endocrinology, two doing uh, hospitalist medicine, and one doing primary care. Um, and then uh, the group just graduated in June. Uh, one is doing vascular medicine up in New York. Uh, one is, uh, <laughs> so he's practicing nephrology because <clears throat> prior to coming here, <clears throat> he already completed nephrology fellowship. So he did his intro medicine residency, and then now he was able to get boarded in nephrology and practice nephrology. Uh, two uh, doing endocrine, one doing hospitalist, one doing hepatology fellowship at the NIH, three doing hospitalist medicine, and one doing primary care. So um, over the past uh, 10 years, uh, this is what the um, overall, um, uh, what things look like. Uh, it looks like... Uh, the most popular destination is hospitalist medicine, but we have a, uh, a good number going into uh, general toll medicine, uh, ID, cardiology, uh, endocrine, GI, um, uh, so different specialties. And it's uh, nice to see it. It's For me, it's gratifying to see a nice diversity of interest here. Okay. Now, just a word about Baltimore. I know you're getting tired. I can see you guys... Uh, uh, nodding off. Uh, so um, I don't know if you've uh, ever been to Baltimore, but the Inner Harbor area, a very festive area, especially in the summertime, uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, Orioles are a baseball team. Orioles Stadium is uh, about a mile away, just south of us. Uh, it um, th They were in the playoffs this year. They were in the playoffs last year. It's fun uh, going to Oriole games. Uh, Ravens are our football team. 
great team. Lock it in. They're going to be the Super Bowl this year. Uh, great team. Uh, we love the Ravens. Uh, the crab is the food of, of, of Baltimore. They're not easy to eat. You need uh, you have to be very uh, patient. Um, uh, there's a skill set involved there. Take some practice. Uh, this is the Baltimore Art Museum. It's located about four miles north of us. And um, um, uh, there's uh, two nice art museums, the, the Walters and the, the Baltimore Museum of Art. <clears throat> Both are free to the public. Uh, so um, we have a soccer team. Um, now, the way that the soccer team works is we play the other residencies in Baltimore. Now, we're a small team. We're a small residency program, So, uh, but we have to compete against University of Maryland, which has 150 residents. We have to compete against uh, Johns Hopkins, which has 160 residents. And here we are. We have 36 residents, and we have to field the team and, and play them. So I told our residents, you got to practice and practice. Well, they said, yes, we're going to practice. Well, here's a picture of them practicing. Uh, I don't know how much practicing they're doing here. And then uh, one day I asked the team, I said, hey, are you guys are you guys practicing? You're rehearsing? They said, yes, yes, we're practicing our plays. I said, okay, great. How are you, how are you doing that? They're doing that using Xbox. Okay, all right. Uh, they, they a lot of lot of lot of eating goes on uh, uh, after work, I guess. Um, and this is uh, this is in in the, in the call room, and a lot of eating goes on uh, uh, at work as well. Um, uh, they um, they they have some outings. Uh, uh, this doesn't look safe to me. Uh, I, I'm here to report, though, that she was, was able to get out of there and she's, she, she survived the day, but I'm not sure that's a particularly uh, safe thing to do. Uh, so this is a picture of our soccer team. They did not win. They did not win. But they borrowed the trophy and they took a picture as if they won. But you have to admit, we have the best shirts. By far, these are the best shirts. Um uh, here's an, the following year. We had another uh, shirt. Uh, uh, they 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 played hard. Uh, we didn't we, we didn't win, but uh, we have. I think we always have the best shirts. Um, we have a medical Jeopardy team, and um, and uh, we compete against the other residencies in Baltimore. And uh, in the past. Uh, uh, the past six years, we won the Maryland competition uh, twice. Uh, so the, when you win the Maryland competition, then you go to the national and you compete there. Uh, here was uh, one of our teams uh, who won the Maryland competition, and so they went to the nationals uh, and, and, and uh, competed there. Um, uh, so the, the the it's a close knit community. They do a lot of things outside the hospital. Uh, well, well, if you're not a Ravens fan, we'll convert you to being a Ravens fan. Uh, they um, uh, now here they all went out for dinner, which makes you wonder what who was covering the hospital. What, what what was going on uh, at the hospital? I, this this doesn't look safe to me. Right. So today, uh, have a great um, uh, experience. Uh, in, in, interview with our faculty. Ask them a lot of questions. Um, th we we want you to uh, walk away with the feeling that you have a sense for what the program is all about. Um, with the, the, we want you to uh, you can dial in on noon conference with our residents. Uh, there's a virtual tour video that we made, and feel free to watch that. Uh, probably the most important part of the day is the session with residents. Um, there's no faculty there. Uh, there's no one for the program there. Uh, the residents have been told that nothing that the applicants say or do will come back to the program. Also, nothing that the residents say or do will come back to the program. Uh, we want the process to be transparent. Uh, we want it to work for you so you can cut loose with any and all 
um, uh, questions, uh, point the re- put the residents on point, and uh, I want you to walk away at the end of the day with a, a true impression of what it's like to be a resident here. Our resident coordinator will go over uh, with you what the benefits are. Uh, and I, I'm here to tell you that routine follow-up correspondence is not encouraged. Don't feel compelled. You have to write a thank you note. Um, I, I, I don't want you to spend time and effort trying to figure that part out. It's, it's, um, this is a policy that's um, adopted by many programs around the country. Uh, it, we feel that's, you know, that's, we don't want you to be spending time uh, getting involved with that. You all have much better things to do. So I'm going to wind up here. I uh, want to th- thank you for your attention. Thanks for hanging in there. I know that it was a, a long, arduous. I hope that the coffee lasted for the duration of the uh, of, of of this uh, of this session. Um, hope you gained appreciation for our program. Uh, I hope that you come to the interview with uh, with a lot of questions, and we'll be glad to uh, address them. Uh, but we feel like uh, we are still in this transition mode of transforming from an independent community hospital that's now an integrated large in, in, in academic medical center. Uh, but we have a community hospital flavor, a community hospital feel uh, that when you come to our hospital, uh, you'll you'll know the security guard, you'll know the people in the in, in the cafeteria, uh, you'll know the nurses on the floor. Because it's a small hospital, you get to know everyone, and it's a different different vibe, a different um, um, atmosphere than a large uh, medical center, uh, which is like a big city compared to us, which is more like a small town. Um, and uh, it, and and uh, I hope that you get that sense. Uh, as you talk to our faculty and residents. So thank you very much and look forward to uh, meeting you. I'm going to sign off now. Bye.